Good afternoon. Um, today I want to talk a bit, um, I want to do a short introduction of some projects you might know uh, and some two projects which you do not know, which are quite recent. But more uh, beyond that, I want to zoom a bit about what I like to call the soft and the hard capital of being an artist or being a designer. And after that, we have some 10, 15 minutes Q&A uh, with, with, with you and, 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 uh, and, and uh, the rest of the audience. So feel free to, to jump in. Um, working in the last three to four years as an artist slash designer slash architect slash inventor, I've been working on these series of interactive landscapes, eh, reacting to sounds and motion of people. And we've always been fascinated of using technology more to create some kind of poetic, to some kind of techno-poetic notion in which we sort of merge these two worlds of fantasy and pragmatism uh, to make things which, which trigger imagination, which are more future-related than past. And at the same time, I realized when a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting a material manufacturer, he introduced me as the hippie with a new business plan, which I actually liked a lot, um, and I'll tell you why. Because I think an artist of today is not so much a sort of Van Gogh, uh, brilliant uh, guy or girl sitting in an attic cutting off little pieces of, uh, of his or her ear. I think that sentiment, I think that will get you nowhere. I, I'm, I'm always doubting if it actually happened that way, but okay, that's history. I think more and more it's interesting to be this half priest, half entrepreneur, in which on one hand you have a clear vision, you have an ideology, you believe in something, yeah? and at the same time you want to engage reality, you want to update reality, you want to manifest with, uh, with that. And, and this creates a, a creative dilemma, so to speak, but these worlds start to collide. And I think this kind of process um, has been with me during the things that I, I made, uh, merging between these worlds of fantasy and pragmatism, um, merging the worlds of beauty and bullshit that, that we all encounter making the things we want to make. And uh, let's, let's zoom a bit about that and, and address the topics of value and price and things like that later on. One of the first pieces we made, which you see here, is June placed in the pedestrian tunnel uh, in Rotterdam, where we were invited by the city to literally have people experience their city in a new way. Hundreds of fibers reacting to the sounds and emotion of the people walking by, to show them in a way that reality is not something static, but it's actually quite liquid. It's being built up the way you can interact. So also here, tech is used, but more as a mediator. You don't see the sensor, it's not important. It's more to attract new type of interactions, um, in which sometimes it's, a, it's like a mirror reacting to what you're doing, but on the other hand, it has a mind of its own, becoming more intuitive. Placing it in the public space uh, of Rotterdam, uh, all different things start to encounter. Um, we placed it in there in such a way that in the first three weeks there was no sign, there was no explanation. So we literally installed it within an hour. So people who went uh, in the morning to work came back and had no idea what they encountered, which I think was good. Um, all kind of different interactions it generates. The director of Eneco thinks it interesting because it's a new way of lighting and wants to support it. City of Rotterdam supported it because it's about safety. Where you walk, there's light, the rest is off. Wedding couples start to intervene with it because it was a great place to have their photos taken. So wedding couples would come and, 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 and leave again. Um, these are all not the reasons why I make these kind of things, but nevertheless, they, they, the work generates them. And I think that's sort of interesting. How can you create things that, that, that start to perform like a hub. And in a similar way, um, it's not just with the artworks themselves, but also in the way I produce them. Eh? Witte Veen and Bos uh, was addressing this uh, just before. Um, I don't think it's a singular artist thing. I believe in network, I believe in process, eh? sort of the Bauhaus 2.0 in that way. So here you see the studio uh, 30 minutes from here, a 1500 square meter uh, lab filled with WizKids, eh? software engineers, uh, architects, designers, and I've been running that studio in the last uh, four years. Uh, and indeed, recently, a studio in Shanghai where we explored a larger uh, public space uh, uh, commissions there. And, and also, it's weird because some things 
work very well in Europe and some things work very well in, in Shanghai um, uh, in terms of the cultural difference. For example, when I do a public space commission in, in Europe, the client always asks, or the, uh, the commissioner, um, are you sure you've done this before? They want to be certain that it works. But when I have a client in, or a context in China, they always ask, are you sure this is the first time? <laughs> and if you mix up that argument, you get really weird conversations. Yeah. So, uh, and you lose the project. But, uh, <laughs> um, so we develop our own technology. Uh, we're, we're a big fan of smart materials. Um, the, the painter has paint, we have our tech. And this has been very important from day one. Yes, you have Arduino, which I recommend you use, but after a while you want to mature, eh? you want to hack, you want to evolve. And in a way, it's good to develop your own tools uh, or steal them from the right people. Um, sometimes you work in commissions, uh, uh, clients, galleries, private collectors, whatever. And sometimes you commission yourself. And I think that is sort of super important. We could have easily paid our rent with making a dune in RGB color and sell it to the media market of this world. But that would be boring. And that would also be, that would suppress the innovative thinking that, that, that I want to trigger eh, towards my audience, towards myself, towards the, the people that work with me and for me. And so sometimes it's very good to, because the, 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 the horror of success is that you get copy paste and you want to copy morph, eh? you want to continue, you have new ideas. And that is part of the struggle which you overrule by being your own client. The bad thing is that there is no budget, no time, no money. But the good thing is that you can do whatever you want uh, and it, soft capital uh, which arises from that will return sooner or later. Intimacy was exactly a project like this which you see here where we started to research with V2 and young Dutch fashion designers the idea of poetry, technology, human body and literally teaming up with a material manufacturer uh, of electronic paper to make dresses which change in transparency where you become more intimate with them. Which made the whisk kids very happy. So here you see it connected uh, to, to her body. And so the more excited she becomes, the more transparent the dress. We have from white to transparent. And, uh, sometimes it's heartbeat, sometimes it's the, 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 the voice of your boyfriend. Or, or so thinking about uh, what happens when social media jumps out of the computer screen and becomes a part of our body, of our environment. And these were first two prototypes that we made. Um, it was picked up by the blogs, went viral. We got a zillions of requests of people actually wanting to buy one, <laughs> which we never intended to. But so right now we teamed up with new Dutch uh, haute couture designers to work on a new series of dresses. Or for example, it reacts to flashlight. Or, but either way, all the, 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 the sensor technology besides. I think it's extremely interesting in a time where transparency yeah, and Facebook, etc., where we expose and we overexpose ourselves. It's extremely fascinating to think about um, communication not display oriented, yes? To make it more tactile, to make it more intuitive, and to think about, yeah, in a way, a new language. And um, talking about it is super important. Here you see our, our dear uh, upcoming uh, Royal Highness, uh, Princess Maxima, um, uh, where I'm trying to convince her that if she wears one, she will be one of the most innovative people in the world. <laughs> and uh, when you look at her face, you can see that she's slightly scared, slightly excited, which I think is, is a really good thing in a way. Yeah. When, you talk, <laughs> when you talk about... Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say. So it, it started with ourselves, with samples, with, with zero budget. And after one year, when it's online, now people want to have it and we can sell them for the price of a good BMW, yes. But I think that's sort of super important to claim your own autonomy. But also, secondly to that, suddenly I got into the fashion scene. You know? I mean, I know about art and architecture and technology, but com yeah, fashion was completely unfamiliar with it. So now I'm being invited by, uh, by fashion, uh, how do you say it, competition to be in a jury, uh, the, or the fashion brands invite me to, to look and exchange. So it forced me to rethink my ABC of designing, of thinking, eh? which I think was incredibly fascinating and difficult, uh, but it's really good to place yourself in these unknown positions and, and, and see what happens. I'm 
going to skip this one. Uh, Google it, sustainable dance floor. Uh, sometimes you sit in a car and you're thinking about future and innovation uh, and sustainability. The project that you see here is sustainable dance floor, a floor which generates electricity when you dance on it, actually uh, produced and alive. And sometimes one day I was sitting in a car on a highway and Witte Veen Bos knows all about it. The, the roads, we spend billions on them every year, especially in the Netherlands. But somehow nobody really seems to care how, how, how we operate with them, how they look like or how they behave. So we started to think, like, okay, what can we do with that? Eh? What, 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 what does the interface of the future look like? And can we think about interactive and sustainable roads? Can we make a Route 66 of the future? And so we started to team up with technical universities, Rijkswaterstaat, Wageningen University, and figuring out ways to get electricity from the road or put induction wires in the road to have electrical cars charging up. A lot of ideas are already out there, but hidden inside a drawer or in a really badly designed prototype, which convinced no one. Um, so we dragged them out and started to make artist impressions from it. Uh, and one day I was giving a lecture somewhere in Maastricht, I think, um, where, without me knowing, the director of Heimans was in the audience, one of the biggest road manufacturers uh, in Europe, eh, infrastructure projects. And he called me the next day with a very basic, almost banal, shameless question, which was, how much? <laughs> Um, uh, well, of course, we had no idea about that at that time, and I wanted to talk about value, not about price. So we made a deal, here you see me talking to him, or we're talking together, uh, where we uh, agreed to sign a three-year uh, three contract to develop this yeah, uh, smart highway. Mm, this is interesting. I think because there are all these kind of things of energies floating around. Eh? Some say uh, you're prostituting your ideas to a commercial company. That's one way of looking at it. I think it's sort of enabling me, me to make my dreams come true. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I never had any, or I, I, this is one of the projects I have the most artistic freedom in any kind of project because they have no idea. So I can, you know, you can plug it, you can hack it, you can update it. And it's sort of super interesting. They are experts in the roads of today. And I think the artists like, like you guys are very good in thinking about tomorrow yeah, or about the future. And if you can combine it, if you can create this kind of West Side story of two gangs who don't really belong, but neither, either way have a common love, in this case, innovation of the Dutch landscape, sort of magic starts to kick in. It's a very personal thing. We say no to Media Mark, we say yes to Heimans. It, 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 it's something you have to decide. But don't forget that Michelangelo, 16th Chapel, now considered as a high end artwork, was commissioned by the Catholic Church at that time. Yeah, which was sort of the mega, mega shell, <laughs> who literally said, hey, uh, what do you think about it? Rembrandt Nachtwacht, eh, commissioned by some rich people who wanted to have their portrait taken. Uh, so you see, there, 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 there's this friction. I think the moment you have a clear agenda of what you want, and you, you stay true to it, and you hack it, eh, you get into their brain, a lot of options start to uh, pop up. And I think that, that you should not be afraid of that. So this is one of the first things we developed. Uh, there are six ideas which, which we're developing with them, which I came up with uh, based on the research we did, and uh, we're building them now. Uh, this is, for example, an incredibly fascinating thing of working with dynamic paints, which change in color when the, the temperature goes up or down. So when it's um, normal, like, like, like zero or, 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 or 10 degrees, there's nothing, but the moment it becomes a bit colder, you get these snow flocks appearing in the road. So the road knows I'm warm, I'm cold, I'm ugly, I'm beautiful. And you can do it very functional in terms of where you can see it's slippery, but you can also do like poetic letters which pop up when you walk by. Um, I think it's sort of incredibly fascinating to, to, to team up and to rethink of our future looks like and, and, and finding the right people to enable the dreams you have in your brain. This is Crystal. And the innovation that they are in the This is Crystal, a piece we developed for ourselves 
where it's sort of after June we became fascinated with interactive lighting and social media, how can you morph your environment? Um, uh, but we wanted to push it one level further and uh, make little uh, LED rocks which are charged wirelessly via weak magnetic uh, power mat beneath it. So you can literally pick them up, write letters with it, stack them, you can either share them or steal them, uh, which people did actually, <laughs> a lot of it were taken. And I think that sort of incredibly was our challenge in a way to think about public lighting, but at the same time that you can personalize, you can customize the world around you in this sort of um, yeah, Zen garden uh, from Mars. Mm, here it's placed uh, in, in the Eye Museum in Amsterdam uh, outside. And I think more and more the things I've been doing, eh, talking about this half priest, half entrepreneur, basically what I want to do, I realize, is that I want to update reality. And there's not so much a difference between a Boyman van Beuningen, which we worked with, or a Louis Vuitton, or you name it. So updating the reality around us, maybe that, that's what it is about. Because especially in the Netherlands, um, you can see that every tree that you have in the Netherlands is artificial. Eh? We live under sea level, so everything is man-made eh? or women-made. Um, when we look at the windmills now, this is Kinderdijk, we, seem them, we look at them as cultural heritage. Eh? They are souvenirs, they are cliché. But at the same time, they were not made for that. They were landscape machines eh? to keep the water level on the, on the right way. Something like that I had in my, the back of my brain when we were commissioned, when we won a commission for the uh, port of Rotterdam, eh, the huge container ship area, we're developing a new mass flux two, uh, a huge industrial area where 15 large windmills will be placed. And the commission was to make a new sort of landmark uh, of 7.5 kilometers with these windmills. Well, what we did was not decorate the windmills with LEDs or make, try to make them look beautiful, which I think they already are. Um, but to sort of think about how we can merge nature and technology into one. The thing with a, with a windmill is, is and you, you might know it when you drive by Afsluitdijk or something, that every windmill moves a bit different. Eh? They all are, there's sort of intonation which drives the, the, the scientists crazy because they want them exact. But of course they're man-made and the wind is always a bit different. So there, there's a slightly natural element within it. And at the same time, they produce uh, wind and they, or they produce electricity. And what we did actually was, was this. I almost did nothing. Literally connecting the, the rotor blades with lines, which according to the amount of wind, uh, the amount of electricity which is produced, start to add and vary creating this sort of matrix-like shapes floating in the air. So suddenly something which is by some considered uh, ugly eh, or unnecessary uh, generates this whole new weird world out there. We know how to do it. It will take us uh, yeah, uh, 1.5 years to build it. We cannot do it in red because otherwise all the ships start to crash on it and things like <laughs> that. So, so all these, these pragmatic stuff. But this is how it will look like. And I think this is important because I think this is what we should be doing. And I, I felt that the conference today was about that. We should find the missing link between our fantasy and between, between our pragmatism, between the beauty and the bullshit uh, which surrounds us, but at the same time between our own imagination and this hard, brutal world. Um, and if you do that consistently, with, and you believe in what you do, um, I truly believe that, 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 that yeah, you can do, in a way, whatever you want, and you can make your dreams come true. Let's put it like that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Before we take questions from the audience, uh, have priests, have engineer, uh, entrepreneur. entrepreneur. How does that work? Do you have to sort of sh shift, do you have to do it like that? Or do you, do you find ways of, of integrating those two persons? Well, uh, yeah. Um, well, I think every person has a certain diversity within itself. So it, 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 it's more interesting to figure it out. And when you look at the tools that you have, you have your own hands, you have 3D printers, you can get money from a fund, you can talk to Witte and Bos, you can 
raw old ladies on a Sunday night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, uh, I, I recommend you to do uh, to do all of that. But I think it's it's super important um, to to trigger the diversity you have in yourself. Yeah, and to 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 hop it. Yeah. That because if you do that right, that's what I experienced. I, I was never taught, but it sort of popped up during the process. You create a sort of value. You create a niche, which becomes interesting, yeah, either uh, in an innovative way or in a more artistic way. Yeah. But but yeah, you, you, maybe you're asking for a key and there is no door, so <laughs> I'm not sure how to. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. To answer that. No, no, it's, it's, it's the kind of answer that I was looking for. Yeah. Okay, questions from the audience for Dan. No questions. Oh, I hate when you're saying. Oh, that's a question there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering, you were talking about collaborating with fashion people. Do you collaborate with other kinds of people or non-creative people? Yeah. And so, I'm yeah. really glad to see the, uh, the crystals because I miss that on Monday. So if you still have them, I'd love to have them. <laughs> I have one. Yeah. For, for you. Yeah, I have one. That's good. Um, yeah, I think, uh, for example, I, I think um, in a way you become a voluntary prisoner of your own idea. <laughs> so you wake up one day and it, it starts, so you, suddenly you, became, you become interested in fashion, and sometimes you become interested in highways, and you start to look for people who, who can connect with you in, an, in a visionary way, but also in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a craftsmanship way, and it's super, super important. So, for example, what I'm doing now is food. Food is completely natural, but at the same time, 100% artificial. There's a huge uh, shortage of it. So, so, so can we sort of super localize our environment, and uh, not this generic tank station food, which is like ah, oh, but 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 sort of uh, yeah, again the hippie, bring back the hippie, but then with a, <laughs> with a sort of hyper sophisticated bio garden to reduce transportation, CO2, and things like that. So what I do then is that, I, yeah, I don't know, I start calling people, I check my LinkedIn, I, I, I talk to my friends, like who can we contact, who, start to, who would be interested, who would have the guts to do it. And client and budget, that usually comes later. Um, and so yeah, there are a lot of, uh, it's not about artistic or non-artistic, but you need to have people who are willing to trigger their creative part. And even the High Ones director, which you saw on the image, which I know for a fact has never been to me before got inspired because we were triggering his notion of what reality could be like. Yes. And, and that's, that sort of opened up uh, his mental map. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's a search. It's a search. But I do think maybe it's good to mention it, especially with the, the, the cultural sector in a, in, within Europe, within the Netherlands, in its tight position as it is right now, by government cuts, etc. On one hand, it's, it's, it's horror what they did and cutting away a lot of um, support. And the other thing, I, thought, yeah, I never waste a good crisis. Eh? <laughs> so let's, let's sort of see, not as a justification, but let's sort of see how we can engage reality again and connect with people to get our autonomy back. Yeah. 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 But a lot of it is about craftsmanship and then you definitely need other people. I'm not going to design that dress. I mean, please, no. We have a question. Um, yeah, well, about the last point, you're not going to design the dress. I'm kind of curious as uh, having an effect as this artist, uh, being an artist, you make stuff, you build stuff. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, maybe you more have people build your stuff. How do you experience this, uh, this transition or maybe balance between really building it for your own ends or having other people build it? And how, how do you see it happen? That's a good question. I think I did a master in architecture, so, so I'm very used to work with models, yes, uh, where you make a prototype. Um, I make it in the plane, I come into the studio, uh, I, I put it on the table and I say, okay, I'm not really sure what it is yet, but it has to be finished in two weeks. And then we get to work. So um, what we do a lot is making prototypes, making models, which, which you know, the technology people look at, okay, where to place the sensor or how, to, how, and the designers look more at how does the light reflects on it and things like that. So you start to add things to that, especially because a lot of people who work in our studio are not Dutch and, are in, and their English is really, really bad. So you have to find a common language, a common tool. Um, 
like an intimacy is more concept based. It's more an idea which I explain to someone and they start to interpreting it. Like a movie director says to Brad Pitt, okay, it's a scene about a guy who lost his wife, go. Um, but it's of course not so that I give them the menu and they can order. I give them the, reci the recipe and they can start to cook. This is, it's, it's a ping pong, not a bowling ban. Yeah? Uh, so <laughs> you could tuk, 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 in which I make things, but this making also makes me. I do think what I'm good at, if I, if I can say that in a non-Dutch way, yeah, you always have to be careful the devil that's about these things, um, is I like the beginning a lot, where, where the idea pops up, and I feel it has a sort of value, but it's still a bit uncertain. It's, 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 it's fragile, in a way. And I like the end, when it's there and it starts to generate stories, these crystals, which people steal and start taking them home and start to realize, hey, I, if I put it in front of my toothbrush uh, charger, it also lights up. So suddenly they start scanning their house for lost energy. And they start sending me these pictures. And oh, I love that, you know. So it's super interesting to make things which are beyond your control. And, 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 uh, but what you do is you, you, how do you say, you instigate, you, you, you push it. And then people pick it up, they enable it. And, yeah. And the entrepreneurial thing is that if we would have been super commercially budget driven, I would have made completely different things. Of course, we run a successful studio, so you, you want to earn money with what you do, eh? because you can do new things again. Um, but what I found out is when, when you create your own niche in the right way, eh? when you do what you do right, and you keep it true to yourself, then, then, then um, people start to talk about value and not about price. And, and that, that, that creates your space for maneuver. Yeah. But it's not easy. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, that's the fun part. Yeah. But I, I noticed, that maybe it's a question towards you guys, is that within, maybe in this academy, but also in uh, Eindhoven or in Amsterdam or Rotterdam, these that kind of discussions are hardly, I, f I don't really feel that they're here in the fine art school. A lot of it is based on self-expression and, and finding concepts and developing it, but not so much is about how to integrate it into reality or it's sort of super commercial eh, where you have to do what the client tells you to do. Is that still the case or question to you, the guy who just asked me? Yeah? I'm just curious towards your education. Well, I'm using this too, so I started my own studio as well and running it now. So okay. I'm in Leiden and I tried to combine art and science and technology and with a circle of business around it. But you studied here? No, I studied in, uh, in Utrecht. Okay. Harvard. Other students? No. No, I'm no, joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. No, no, you. Okay. What more you would like? But yeah, I think it's also just doing it and experiencing it. I think it's kind of hard to, to get it taught. True, but when I when I did when I did Aki yeah, in uh, Enschede, when I in the third year I asked for a tax number BTW, yeah, which I could got uh, which you, anyone can get. I, the, the tutors thought it was like sort of dancing with the devil, eh? like oh, that's like, but I was like no, I get ninety percent back from my materials. I can make ninety percent more art. Hello, you know, <laughs> like it's a tool. Start using it. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious if this sentiment is still floating within these kind of uh, academies, uh, because two years it was still like that. Maybe if someone wants to respond to that. Because that is the creative struggle we are in these, these yeah, days. I don't really have an answer to it, but I okay, have a question fine. that derives from it. Um, Good. So what do you suggest should uh, art academies and other uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, universities start well, I know some universities are doing it already, but uh, getting uh, businesses inside uh, the academy, uh, you know, mm -hmm. start uh, getting the, for example, uh, capital investors inside the, yeah. uh, in, inside the little companies, starting up, startups in the mm -hmm. in the academies. What do you think about that? Is well, that a good development? Well, I mean, if, yeah, it's good and bad. When you look at the hospital industry, yeah, the, the venture capitalists start kicking in, and you know what happened there. Uh, uh, they, can, they can eat you from the inside out. You have to create this West Side story. It, in a way, it's about love. <laughs> it, uh, uh, of course, uh, completely uh, in, a, in a mental way. Um, uh, but you have to create a network of interest, yes? Where you don't necessarily agree on everything, but you have one thing. 
which is, for example, innovation or, 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 or food or um, uh, learning how people to be more creative. Yeah. And if you collect people within or around that point, then you can communicate with them without necessarily having to agree. Um, um, but then again, yeah, that's only one of the many, many ways. Yeah. I'm, not an, um, I'm not an expert in that. I just do, I, I follow my gut feeling. Yeah. But Bauhaus did it in yeah, 1920, 25. So, so for sure the future is about creating these kind of links. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question. Good question. Hey, yeah. Hey. How, how's uh, life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a large part of your uh, work and process is, uh, I think, uh, um, innovative. If you, if you start moving from highways to food, it, it, takes, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of new um, energy to, to get into this, into this subject, and to experiment, and to talk with people. How do you, um, and the whole company, how do you fund these, these more experimental times? How do you make them happen? Well, first of all, is, is okay, uh, convince people that they, 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 if they want to have a nice shop or a nice house, uh, go and works for, uh, go for work in Philips. Yeah, so uh, the, the profit that we make, we spend it in our self-commissioned projects. And the tendency is 50-50, 60-40. So 60 of of the project that we do are, are well, should be above zero, yeah? should be profitable, either if it's uh, Sydney Biennale who commissions us to make a new June version, or a Hyman who, who pays for a process, yeah? not for a product, but a process for three years. But at the same time, this kind of food or intimacy are, are based in this 40%, but they, they, they feed each other. So we learn things. Uh, so you build this incredible amount of knowledge, which is, which is there the moment you receive a new project. Um, this is this relation between soft and hard capital, which I addressed before, uh, which is always a struggle. Yeah, but, but, but doing commission projects and self-commission, that, that's where the key starts, yeah. Generating your own knowledge, your own niche, um, um, and, and, and finding the right people who are willing to go, to go with that, yeah, and have a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. But in a way, I feel more and more like, like a sort of like a journalist who goes out there and does research. Yeah? 